And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Oh, yes, it does. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on, sing it out. So when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. The battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our god and almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win every battle Stand against the power, come on, Almighty Fortress, and Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. I mean, we're going to keep worshiping this morning, so just continue to join and sing along with us today.
Jesus, you came to my rescue. Took my place upon that cross. You redeemed what I had lost. Now my whole world revolving around you. You're the center of my life. You're the treasure. You're the prize. So is so easy to sing and so easy to live out and um, but boy that's our challenge every day is to be more like Jesus and to follow him anywhere hey my name is Travis I'm the worship minister here and once again it's a joy to have you here this morning to worship with us it's so amazing to hear your voices just fill this room and um, I know the Holy Spirit is moving uh, just so you know we had three baptisms in the first service again this week And we have one more after communion. So, I mean, God is continuing to move, yeah, in this place. And what's happening is people are making room for Jesus in their life. People are making room for the Holy Spirit to move. And sometimes that means that you gotta lay down some things. Sometimes that means that you gotta put down fear and anxiety and worry. And you gotta focus in and lean into the Holy Spirit speaking and moving in your life. And this morning, we want to we want to make that a prayer that God would allow us and would give us the strength to do these things, to lay these things down, so that we can take a step in Jesus's direction and follow Him anywhere. Truly follow Him. So we're going to continue to worship. Words will be on the screen. I pray that this next song would be a prayer for you, that it would seep into your heart and turn into a prayer, maybe a prayer, a daily prayer that we all need to pray. Um, so let's continue to worship. And let's sing to the Lord today and open up our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to move in our life.
crown This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender
<laughs> again, what a hard thing, an easy thing to sing, what a hard thing to do, but through the Spirit's work in our life, we can do that. We can do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to move into a time of communion so you can be seated. I want to kind of keep this worshipful feeling on this moment going because communion is just an extension of worship. And as we hold the elements of communion in our hands, the, the bread and the cup, we just get this, this image of Jesus surrendering his life on the cross for us. His body was broken and his blood was poured out and all for me, all for you. And I don't know about you, I wouldn't do that for somebody A, I didn't know and B, doesn't deserve it. But Jesus laid his life out for you. Regardless, knowing what you would do and what you wouldn't do, Jesus did it for you. Because he wants to spend eternity with you and he loves you so much more than your sin. And so this morning, I just pray that as we take this cup and this juice or the, the bread, that we can focus in on what Jesus did for us and be reminded of the weight of that, but yet the victory that we have in Jesus because of an empty tomb. And so this morning, as you take this uh, communion, let's just pray, let our prayer be that we would make room for Jesus today, that we would be on mission with Jesus today, that we could follow the Holy Spirit and allow him to, to lead us and guide us. And so I'm gonna pray. There'll be some uh, scriptures on the screen you can use to help you walk through this moment. If, you are, uh, if you're not a believer yet, if you're still on the fence, if you still have not made that decision to follow Jesus, one, I pray that today the Lord would speak to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit would move in your life. Uh, and two, you can still use this moment just to pray through, uh, maybe, maybe that the Lord would help you into that decision. But I'm gonna pray and then we can spend a few moments uh, in communion. Father, Lord, we're so thankful for what you've done for us. Lord, we're so thankful that not only are we able to lay our burdens at your feet, but you invite us to lay our burdens at your feet. And so God, today, as we hold these elements of communion in our hands, knowing full well what it cost and knowing full well what it does for us in eternity, Lord, I pray that we can be thankful. I pray that we can be reflective and I'm, thankful, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can be moved today to be on mission with you. Lord, we are so thankful for these last few weeks that you've led us into this discussion, and we just pray today would be an extension of that. So Lord, have your way in the next few moments. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Mount Gilead Church. My name is Chad. I'm the student minister here and we are excited to be here this morning because this is a church where discipleship is what matters. And today, right at this moment, we get to see that with another baptism here as we welcome another member to our family here. So we can do that now. This is Dagan and this morning he's come to profess his faith in Jesus and be baptized by his uncle John. Dagan, I'm going to have you repeat this confession of faith after me. I believe 
I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept Him. And I accept Him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Upon your confession of faith, you're being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. I think it is so evident that God is doing incredible things here at Mount Gilead, and we are excited to be a part of that. And if this is your first time here, I just want to say welcome. We are glad you're here with us. This is the place where you belong. You belong to this place, and we want to welcome all of you here. Whether you're here in person or you're online, we are grateful that you're here with us. If you're here in person, outside of these doors, after service, if you could stop by Guest Central, just so we can get to know you, that you can be known to the people here in this place. And we have a gift for you. And again, we just want to say welcome. So like we said earlier, this is the place where discipleship is what we want. We want people to understand who Jesus is. And As a part of the team for family ministry, we have this incredibly beautiful thing called Milestones. And a couple of months ago, we saw here on the stage with 20 plus families dedicating their children, their babies, to be raised in a manner of discipleship, of understanding who Jesus is. And so we have this great pathway. And tonight, we get to see the capstone of that pathway. We have a thing called Senior Blessing, where we're going to have our seniors come back with their parents, and we're just going to have a time where we can be a blessing to them. Their parents can be a blessing as well. And this is not just for them. This is for our entire family. This is all of you guys included outside of these doors. For a couple of weeks, there have been a table of Bibles. And I would encourage and challenge you to go out there today and write a message. Whatever your favorite scripture is, that thing that helped you understand who Jesus was, that piece of scripture, write that down, underline it, write them a message because we want to send our seniors out well into this world. And what better gift can we give them than a Bible full of scripture that's been ordained by God, but has now been gifted from you, this church. We are excited to see what God is going to do. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for who you are. We're thankful for the way that you have been here, that you are investing in this place. God, we are thankful for what you do. In your name we pray. Amen. And speaking of investment, uh, we want you guys as a church to invest as well, to be a partner alongside us. So there are three ways that we can give. Number one is uh, we want to make sure that you can use the app. That's my favorite way of giving. It's simple. It's easy. You can go online and do that as well. Or we have boxes around the room and you guys can do that as well. So would you guys join me as we begin and we continue on in this series of what does it mean to walk and follow with Jesus? Good morning. I believe there is new life in this place. Amen. I believe there is hope in this place. Amen. I believe that the old has gone and the new has come. Amen. And I believe that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Hey, we've been on an amazing journey, haven't we? These last several weeks have been a a wonderful uh, experience in the family of God. So many uh, decisions. Um, But but here's the good news. The journey is going to continue. Even though the sermon series, this Walk With Me series, uh, is ending uh, next week when when Jeff's going to conclude it, the the, the journey of following Jesus and walking with Jesus, the the journey of faith is going to continue. And I love that because... There's so many new things to explore. I mean, those of you that have been doing this for decades, wouldn't you agree that that one of the things that makes faith so different from any other life experience 
uh, is that there's new things to learn in the Lord all the time. New ways to be stretched, new ways to grow, different people to connect with and to serve alongside of. The journey is, is going to continue. Uh, if you happen to be here for the very first uh, time with us this morning, just a special welcome. You're coming at a time that's a special season in the history of Mount Gilead Church. And we're trying to learn together, what does it mean? When, when I come up out of the baptistry, Deegan just got baptized this morning. When he comes up out of the baptistry, what's next? Like, what do I do now? You know, what, and, and all of us probably need that reminder every once in a while. Like, what, what do I do now as, as a disciple? Um, we've been using this definition over the last few weeks during this series that a disciple is, is involved with, with three different things. Number one, a disciple is following Jesus, is one who is following Jesus. And the idea there is that nobody here is in coast mode, right? We are in active pursuit of this man, this Savior that we love. We are following Jesus. Number two, a disciple is one who is being changed by Jesus, and the idea there is that, that as a disciple, as a, as a believer, one who has accepted Jesus, you are going to look different today than you looked yesterday. That the Holy Spirit is working inside of you to help you become like Jesus. And that's a process. We're being constantly changed by him. And number three, and what we're going to talk about this morning, is that a disciple is one who is on mission with Jesus. But I want to say something as we, as we begin that sort of serves as a foundation for everything else we're going to talk about this morning, and it's this, that, that, that we did not create our mission. No, we received our mission. And it's important that we understand that. You remember the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples, really his last instruction to us before he went up in, in, into heaven. So this was after the cross, and after the resurrection and the empty tomb, and after the 40 days that he made appearances to his disciples, he said, I got one more thing for you. He gave us a great commission, right? And he said, Matthew 20, I want you to go into all the world and make what? Make disciples, right? And that's why, even though he said that 2,000 years ago, that's why we as a church still hold on to that. And that's why you see out in the lobby, when, when you come into church every Sunday morning, those words on the wall, we exist to help people become lifelong disciples of Jesus. That's, that's the mission. We want people in Mooresville, Indiana. We want people in Morgan County. We want people in central Indiana. And really through our partnerships, people all over the world, every person walking on the planet, we want them to know Jesus. We want the world to come to know him and to walk with him. And Paul wants that too. In fact, he talks about that at the very beginning of Colossians. We talked a little bit about this last week. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 6. Let's, six. Let's start there. He writes, in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's Grace. Here's what Paul's saying. Look, when you go down deep into Jesus and you start to become like him, and we may not understand how that works, but it works. When, when our roots go deep into grace and the gospel, the good news, he, he, he does this work in us. We start to become like him, but Jesus starts working in us, not just for us. He works in us so that he can work through us for the sake of the whole world. And I think sometimes people miss that. Sometimes people miss the truth that if you commit to Jesus, you are committing to a mission, uh, to a mission that is way bigger than you. If you ever read uh, Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, you will probably never forget the very first line of that book. Very first line, very first chapter, it says, it's not about you. And it's not. I mean, there's a massive benefit, a personal benefit when we are baptized and we receive the forgiveness of our sins and we, we know we are bound for heaven and eternal life. We, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to take anything away from that. 
But God saving us is not just for us. It's about so much more. I heard the story about two women that reconnected after a long time apart, and one of the women said, man, I missed you. Where have you been? And the second lady said, well, I've been taking a first aid course. And the first woman said, well, has it been useful? And the, the second lady said, well, yeah, really useful. In fact, the other day I'm walking down the street, I hear a car crash, I look out, and sure enough, there's been an accident, there's bodies on the street, blood everywhere, people are crying out for help, and I thought I was gonna pass out. And then I remembered my first aid course, and I put my head between my legs and I didn't pass out. <laughs> now, what's wrong with that? It's the idea that if you take a first aid course, it's for the purpose of being a blessing to someone else when they're in need. Now, here's the thing. If you get saved by Jesus and you allow him to start changing you, of course your passion for Jesus and your personal discipleship is gonna grow, but your passion for people who are not living with Jesus is gonna grow too. And we realize it's not about us. Let me put it this way. The deeper I go with Jesus, the wider my vision becomes. The deeper I go into the grace and the gospel of Jesus, the wider my heart becomes, my, my burden for other people. Football fans might recognize uh, this man. This is Coach Bill McCartney. He coached the Colorado Buffaloes in the 1980s, won a national championship uh, with them. He was a great coach. Um, came to follow Jesus, and that became the most important part of his life. And so before a big game, he invited a local pastor to come and, and speak to the team. And he gets up and he talks for about 30 minutes, this pastor, he talks about grit and fight and resilience and coming together to win the game. And he sits down next to coach Bill McCartney and he says, what'd you think? And the coach says, well, you know, it seems like all you care about is if they win the game. And all I care about is if they know Jesus, maybe we should switch places. And it wasn't long after that that Coach McCartney retired and started a ministry you may have heard of called Promise Keepers, helping men find Jesus. You and I, in the same way, have been called into the mission of Jesus. And you know what one of my favorite parts about this mission is? That yes, he wants to use you with, in your strengths and all the things that you are good at and all your blessings, but he also wants to take all your mess ups and all the bad days and all the junk you've been through and turn your pain into purpose. That's how this mission works. But as Paul concludes this letter, this letter to the uh, Colossians. We were in chapter one last week. We're gonna be in the fourth chapter this week. If you have a Bible, turn there. He's gonna encourage Christians to join the mission. We're gonna read the text and it's gonna sound like a long list of names and you'll see a lot of names in there. But listen closely because also in this text is a massive lesson and a massive invitation. Let's read it together. Chapter four, starting with verse two. Paul writes, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. 
These are the only Jews among my coworkers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send their greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains, grace be with you. Paul says, join me in this mission, church. He says, come to Jesus, confess him as Lord, repent, turn away from your sins, be baptized, but when you get out of the water, get a towel quick and dry off and put your work clothes on because we're going to work and we're going to build this thing called the kingdom of God together. It's going to take three things. I want to give them to you this morning. Number one, it starts with this. We're going to pray open opportunities. Pray open opportunities. Now notice, I didn't say pray for open opportunities. I said pray open open opportunities because in prayer we're not just anticipating the opportunities to be opened for us but we're also in a sense creating opportunities to share the gospel in prayer what we're doing is we're talking to God about the people in our lives that we love before we speak to them about the God that we love we're going to pray open some opportunities by the way this was Paul's favorite prayer request. Paul spent a lot of time in prayer, and when he asked people to pray for him, it was almost always that doors would be open. Look back at verse three, what we just read a second ago. He said, pray for us too, why? That God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. He's in prison when he writes this. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now, don't you find that interesting? I find that fascinating. Because I'm thinking, if I'm in prison and there's a group of people out there praying for me and I got one shot to one prayer request, well, what am I going to ask them to pray for? I got out of prison. <laughs> exactly. That's not what Paul prays for. In fact, he says, this, this prayer, he says, you don't have to change my circumstances. God, I'm not asking you to change my circumstances. I'm asking you to change me. And can I tell you, I hope I can get there in my faith one day. And maybe, maybe you feel that way too. Like maybe, maybe things didn't go the way you saw things going in your life. Maybe your finances are a mess or maybe your relationships are a mess or your career isn't where you had hoped it would be. Maybe we can get to that place like Paul got where he said, God, I'm not asking you to change my circumstances, but would you change me? Even in this dark moment of my life, would you use me? He prayed it again in Ephesians chapter six from prison. This is a consistent prayer request. Look what he, what, what he prays. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is a man who is sold out to the mission of Jesus. And we too want to have that same desperation, that same willingness to be used in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. So we pray open opportunities, that's first. But secondly, we do this. We, we, we wanna be open to any opportunity to talk about Jesus. We're gonna pray open, then we're gonna, we're gonna be open. In other words, look for what you ask God for. A door that unexpectedly opens. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. Maybe you didn't plan on it. Maybe you didn't schedule it, but God opened the door. And Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. Have you ever thought maybe the people that you thought were interruptions in your life were actually divine appointments? 
that maybe those are the opportunities that God was opening up right in front of you. And so we want to be people ready for it, to take full advantage of it, to talk about Jesus. We just saw the words of Paul in uh, verse 6 of our text. He talks about conversation. He's going to talk to us about how to, how to speak. And we're going to stop right there because he makes a point that I don't want to gloss over, and it's this, that the gospel is more than just good deeds. The gospel is also good words. The gospel is a story to be told. The gospel is good news to be shared. And I'm not against good deeds. I'm not against modeling Christ to the world around us. That's certainly part of it. When we model our faith well, it should undoubtedly advance the kingdom. But let's just be very clear about this. A gospel that is all do and never talk is an incomplete gospel. Let me illustrate it this way. Imagine you have a neighbor, and imagine your neighbor doesn't know Jesus. And when your neighbor's wife gets sick, you take over supper, I mean, that's great. And when your neighbor breaks his leg, you offer to mow his yard, and that's great. When your neighbor gets cancer, you go and, and visit him in the hospital, hospital. But when your neighbor dies, what gospel did you expose your neighbor to? That being a Christian is just about being a good person, about being a moral person. And that's all great, but that's not enough. What the neighbor needed to hear was the message and the news that we aren't saved by being good. We are saved by trusting in the goodness of God. And we're not saved by putting our faith in what we do, but by putting our faith in what was done for us at the cross. That's the message that must be told. And when we speak it, and when we share it, it's never with judgment, it's never with hate, it, it's always characterized by a spirit of grace. Look at verse six. He says, let your conversation, what you talk about, be always always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Boldness mixed with kindness. And yes, it is possible to be a bold Christian and a kind Christian at the very same time. Helping people become thirsty for Jesus by seasoning our conversation with salt. Look, I'm not, I'm not called, and you're not called, to be anybody's judge. I'm not called and you're not called to be anybody's prosecuting attorney. We are called, you and I are called in that courtroom. What, what position are we? We are called to be witnesses, to go to the stand. Just like what we talked about last week, Paul's words uh, out of Acts chapter 20. We are called to testify to the goodness of the grace of of God. Be ready to tell anybody what Jesus has done for us. Uh, Peter writes this, 1 Peter 3, 15. He says, always be prepared to give an answer. Have words to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Look, th this is one of the reasons why over the last few weeks, we've asked you to consider walking with someone. Uh, we've, we've titled this series, Walk with me, and, and we're asking you to go to the, go to the uh, Mount Gilead app, the, home, the homepage of the app, and you'll see a black box there, and a black box that has the words, take your step on there. And you just tap that, you fill out a form, and you raise your hand, you let us know, either, yes, I wanna, I wanna walk with somebody, I wanna serve as a mentor, or a guide, a friend, sort of a spiritual sponsor to somebody, or raise your hand and say, you know what, I'd like somebody to walk with me. I wanna go places in my faith. I'm, gonna, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. I could use somebody kind of helping me and guiding me. Now, again, ideally, all of us would be in both kinds of relationships. Like I want somebody pouring into me, helping me with where I'm at in, in my stage of faith. And then I wanna turn around because I'm filled up by the Holy Spirit and by somebody else guiding me. I, I, I then wanna pour into somebody else, right? And we're asking you to do that. So many of you have already raised your hand. 
I just have to say thank you to those who have already taken that step. Also, uh, just a shout out to our adult ministry team. They've been working very hard trying to put people together and get this process going. If you haven't heard from them yet, um, just be patient. They're, they're working through the list. It's gonna take some time. This is a process. We wanna do this the right way. Some of you have already been matched up and I've already heard some stories of people getting together and talking about what God's doing in their lives and working with one another and it's been amazing. But this is gonna be a process. This is, this is part of a, a, a culture shift we are making together as a church. We celebrate all these decisions as we, as we should. But you know, one of the reasons that so many of them made those decisions is a direct result from someone praying for them. Maybe a few weeks, maybe a few years, maybe a few decades. Somebody was praying for them. Somebody was teaching them. Somebody was leading them. And my question is, when's it going to happen again? Who do you have in mind? Who will you pray for? Who will you speak to? Pray open, be open. And number three, we want to stay open to how God can use you and others in his mission. We just read that last chapter and there were several names that, that Paul brings up interesting names. He's lifting up Christ, but he's also identifying specific people in this church that had already joined the mission. He brings up Tychicus, who's a great encourager. We got a lot of encouragers here at Mount Gilead, but we need more. Maybe God is calling you to be a great encourager of others here. He brings up Epaphras, who is a prayer warrior. I know for a fact, we got some prayer warriors at Mount Gilead Church, but maybe that's what he's calling you to, to be a part in the mission. We need more prayer warriors in this place. He mentions Justice and Aristarchus, fellow Jews who had been a great source of comfort to him. You know, we got a lot of, a lot of people at Mount Gilead Church that provide nurture and comfort to a lot of other people, but we need more. Maybe that's what you're called to. But the two guys I want to focus on the most who deserve special attention are named Onesimus and Mark. And these two guys are special because the truth is they'd have a hard time getting accepted into Bible college today. They'd have a hard time getting hired at a church today. You know why? Because they had a past. You remember Mark, he went on the first missionary journey with Paul and another man named Barnabas. A little context on Mark. Mark grew up a Jew. He grew up living in Jerusalem, sort of the center of Jewish culture. He was comfortable around other Jews. And so when the missionary journey began, he was comfortable. Why? Because they went to Jewish settlements and they went to Jewish synagogues and they hung out with a lot of Jewish people. So he was, he was doing great. He was comfortable. But then they went to a place called Pamphylia, and it was Gentile country, non-Jews. They didn't visit synagogues, and they didn't hang out with Jews. And Mark couldn't take it. He left. He, he abandoned the mission. And scholars and experts kind of debate why that happened, but they also suggest that one of the reasons why he left was because of some lingering racist residue in his heart. He had a reputation. That's why Paul said, if you caught it in chapter four, he said, now you heard about him. When he shows up, treat him well. And then you remember Onesimus. He, he was from the city of Colossae, but he was a former slave with a bad reputation, a thief, a runaway. And Paul chooses him to be part of the mission and to bring the letter back. See, here's the thing about the mission. The mission is to tell people about a gospel that says there is nothing in your past that will keep Jesus from giving you a new future. And isn't it true that the people that are the best proclaimers of grace are the people that know how much they need grace? And so, according to the church tradition, not, not only did Onesimus become a member of the church in Colossae and a strong Christian, he would later go on to be the bishop of Ephesus. 
have great influence in the church as it was developing. And you remember Mark, in Paul's last letter before he dies, he says, get Mark, bring him to me. He became very dear to Paul. In fact, Mark got to, got to be chosen to write one of the biographies of Jesus. He's one of the four gospel writers. Listen, when the Holy Spirit picks you to write one of the biographies of Jesus, you've had a really good day. <laughs> and Onesimus and Mark remind us to stay open to how God can use anyone on this mission. Where is he calling you? Several years ago in Australia, there was a, a wedding ceremony taking place at a very scenic spot outdoors on a ledge with a, a body of water beneath. And they're having this ceremony when in the middle of the ceremony, not far away, a woman who was not part of the ceremony fell down the cliff and into the water began to drown. The best man did something surprising. He, he immediately left the wedding ceremony, took off, jumped off the ledge into the water. He was a good swimmer and swam out to help save the woman. The bride herself happened to be a registered nurse. And so in her full wedding gown, she leaves the wedding ceremony and goes down to the shore and starts administrating CPR to this woman. And together they were able to save her. And it's a powerful reminder that while we love our ceremonies and our gatherings and our services and our groups, nothing trumps the mission. So, so we come together and it's powerful and we love it. I love being here. I love starting my week with all of you, but the church is not a gas station where we all come and get filled up and then stay at the pump. Wouldn't that be a strange sight? No, we come and we get refilled and we get recharged and then we go and we scatter and we live on mission. And so we're gonna close this morning and we're gonna, we're just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna pray open some doors. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me. And I'm just going to ask you to silently, I'm going to give you some things to pray about silently as you think about your role in the mission and about perhaps some specific people that God might want you to reach. Would you just bow your head with me? And let's just start with a, with a time of thanks and praise to God for saving us personally and inviting us into this mission. Let's, let's spend some time thanking him for that. Some of, some of us have family members who do not yet know Jesus. Think about them. Lift them up specifically to the Lord right now. Let's pray open doors to speak to our family members about Jesus. Now let's think about our places of work or perhaps where we go to school, where we spend maybe 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Let's think about people that we rub shoulders with every day that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ.
And let's close by thinking about our neighbors, people who live right next to us in our same vicinity, our communities, lots of people out there that are walking without the hope of Jesus. Let's pray open doors in our neighborhoods. Father, how thankful we are, number one, that you saved us with all of our junk and baggage and sin. You turned what was scarlet into something that was white as snow. And we thank you. We thank you forever. And we also thank you, God, that you have allowed us to join you on this mission to help the whole world know this greatest story ever told. That there is a God who has created the world and who loves the world and who wants to spend eternity with his creation. Father, I pray that we as a church would only grow in our burden and our hunger to share this great news with the world. Father, would you open doors, even this week, for us not only to model Christ to someone else, to be the feet and the hands and feet of, of Jesus, but that we could share the story and testify to the good news of your grace in our lives. May it be so, God, to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. If you need to pray with someone more today, or if you're at a place where you need to make a decision for the Lord today, Fred's gonna be right outside that door to the side. Don't leave here if you have a burden or would like to speak to someone about that today. I hope you have a great, dry rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you next week. God bless.